Welcome to Brewment, the podcast show. My name is Ichiro Takahashi, and each week we bring you the person or the message that will help improve your life. Thanks for tuning. Now, let's begin your journey. In this week's episode, I had the pleasure of being accompanied by my recently made new friend, Bjorn Reyrian. Who's Bjorn? Well, I'm not going to get into so many details from his personal life, for the main reason that they're not going to be relevant to the conversation you're about to enjoy during the next 55 minutes. But I'll give you a couple of highlights. Back in 2015, Bjorn decided to read 24 books as an experiment, two books a month. Interestingly, he ended up reading the astonishing amount of 80 books during that year. We talked about the reason behind this experiment the first book he read, his reading process, and how to take notes properly while reading a book. We also talked about his other experiments. Yes, if he, ha if he finds interesting, an interesting idea on a book, he has to test it out. One of the most remarkable of these experiments is the rejection therapy experiment, where he decided to look for weird instances to be rejected for a whole month. But for his surprise, the one thing he filed at was not getting rejected. A square of pizza and a shout out from Daniel Priestley, author of the book Oversubscribed, are now part of his life anecdotes. And if I were to add another highlight to the introduction of this episode, I will mention his experience facing his fear of publicly speaking. Anyways, without further ado, say, for my part, please enjoy. Bjorn, welcome to Improvement the Podcast Show. It took us a while to make this happen, huh? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I was thinking about how to start this, this episode, and I think that I'm going to rewind the clock a bit. What I would like to do is to go back to 2015 and... Fact check me if I'm wrong, but I understand around that time you started to read an immense amount of books. Could you take us back to that time frame? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, well, I haven't always uh, read a lot of books. I mean, when I was younger, I've always been a slow reader, and I'm still a slow reader. I actually did a test like a couple of months ago, and I'm still below average in reading speed. Uh, so I haven't, uh, I didn't read much naturally because it didn't come natural to me because I was kind of a slow reader. I could read maybe two, three books a year on a good year uh, when I was younger. Uh, but I've always been very curious and I've always been interested in like nonfiction books, uh, uh, things about human nature. Uh, it could be spiritual books as well, uh, but usually stuff that has some kind of base in reality that was the kind of books that i've picked up since i was a teenager i think uh, but when it comes to this passion that i have now like i'm i'm very much uh, i'm review i'm reviewing books i'm reading a lot of books uh, and this actually came from i was inspired actually by ty lopez if you know who that is absolutely Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, back in the day, he was all about uh, knowledge and books, and he re did some really inspiring content on his YouTube channel when he talked about all his books, and he shared some takeaways and all of that, and I thought, hmm, maybe I should try to read some more books. So I actually set up a challenge for myself. I think it was in 2015, yeah, something like that. It's hard to remember now. But I wanted to read so 24 books. It was like a goal for me that was really big for me, like 24 books in a year. That's so much more than I have ever read. That's two books a month. It was it was a big enough goal for having me excited about it. And also a little bit like I know it would take a lot from me. Uh, so I started reading this book. And as I got into this challenge, I noticed that I was way ahead of my goal that I would reach uh, 24 books very easily. Um, wow. And one of the reasons for that was that I found uh, Audible and audiobooks, which made me be able to read while I was working out, while I was wa out walking, while I was doing chores at home, like doing dishes and stuff. So, I mean, it all adds up. 
So I uh, revised that goal like a few months in to, okay, I want to do uh, 52 books, like one book a week. That would be insane <laughs> for me to do. Uh, and at the end of that year, I managed to read 80 books. So I got from reading like, as I said, two to three books to reading 80 books in one year that year. And uh, I really, the habit, <laughs> you know, it really became a really strong habit. And as I started to read more, I also got all these insights and ideas. So it was like every month was a paradigm shift for me mentally because I, I wasn't used to getting exposed to these amount of ideas new ways of thinking um so after after that year i could just not see myself anymore living a life without reading avidly and uh, yeah i think that's how it started like it started with that challenge and being inspired by tai lopez and uh and then it just became a really strong habit and i yeah, I just I started to love books, and I mean, you probably had the same experience if you read a lot of books. That once you read a book, you find either a topic or a recommendation in that book for two other books. So your reading list and your interest just grows all the time. Mm. Mm. What What will be the book that you can see that as the kick started of this journey? Uh, you, that's a good remember? question. I, I, it's all a bit of a blur, but I remember reading Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. That was a really strong reading experience for me. I don't know exactly why, but I was in the beginning of this journey and it was like, God, this book is so good. I, I need to find more books like this. So that was yeah. a big one. And I also read, I know I read Sapiens just came out back then as well uh Yuval Noah Harari's book about yeah. yeah you know which one and it was also like a powerful book to read because one of the motivations behind me wanting to read more was kind of a negative um, motivation like I felt like I didn't have enough knowledge from school so I felt like not stupid but I felt like I wasn't well informed so to speak. So that was kind of an sort of an anxiety almost that motivated me to get into books. Um, and it was just fascinating to read all these books about like the history of man, world history, and reading biographies and learning about all these people. It, uh, it's a really cool thing. So it started in that like kind of negative motivation, but right now it's just it's not like that. Yes. It's just something I need to. I need to do. <laughs> I get so much out of it. I will say um, that. Well, first I was uh, misinformed in that case. I I thought that you read forty books a year, and now you tell me that you read twice wow. that amount. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's a good point. Uh, I that was actually just that one year. I was on parental leave as well, so I didn't work. <laughs> I was. Home with kids uh, and help because I was walking. Amount of, yeah, I walk. I'm pretty sure that to, to touch yeah. upon that idea later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. But first, man, I believe that when you say that you were kind of, you, you felt that you had a lack of knowledge, so to mm -hmm. speak. I believe that nowadays with just one or two books, you are like way ahead of <laughs> half of humanity, like literally billions of people, like right now like the culture uh is not about reading and knowledge it's just fast consumption i'm not sure if you agree with me if you pick the right books i, I definitely agree with you it takes it doesn't take as much as you think to use mm. uh just to add on to your knowledge like there's so many yeah, there's so many good books like if you pick the right ones you only need to read like three of them and you are you're way ahead yeah, definitely, man. Maybe maybe we can come back later to that to that idea. Maybe we can talk about what are the three books that anybody should or could read to be like ahead of <laughs> I don't know half of, of of human population. Man, I I believe that you're being such a great influence for your kids. How many books have they read? Are my kids. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I mean, the oldest one is just 
five and the younger one is one years old, but we read every night. And I mean, those books aren't very long. So yeah, he, I pro he probably reads 80 books a year as well. I mean, we have the library nearby and mm -hmm. it's all good. Uh, are they reading more than you at that age? I don't know, actually. I don't remember. I think my mom and dad read for me when I was a kid every night, but it's usually like you have these 12 books in the shelf and you keep reading them over and over again until you know them by heart almost. I know my mother, she told me the story when I got my little brother when I was four years old. I read my my childhood's books for him out of, just from memory because I've read them so many times with my parents. <laughs> That's that's super nice, man. Dude, one of the first conversations we had, maybe it was the first one, was about your rejection therapy experiment, which immediately reminded me my first steps into this world of self-improvement. Um, but before we get into that, let's go back to the beginning of these experiments, 2017. I read that originally you started your Instagram page to share the small experiments you conduct. Yeah, I... Uh... Well, I've always been like a curious person, not only like I want that I want to read a lot uh, about new ideas, but I also want to try things out. People say, okay, this is a good thing uh, in a book or wherever. And then I want to try it for myself just to verify it. Uh, so I think, I, I mean, the whole reading process started as an experiment. I, the experiment was, could I read 24 books in a year? So. I just think it's a fun frame of mind when I take on something. Like if you frame it as a laboratory experiment, then it becomes more light in a way and lighthearted, I feel. And regardless of what you are trying out. And, and I mean, I've done a lot of, my experiments have been on very different scales. Like some are longer, like I did last year, I did meditation for one year, not one year in a row, mind you, but uh, <laughs> um, trying to sit down and meditate every day. So that's why it's like a bigger experiment. And it has like smaller ones, like I re replaced all my socks because uh, <laughs> for the idea was that I would, if I throw away all my socks and buy new socks and all of them looks exactly the same, then I would save time because I didn't need to pair them after I wash, wash them. So I could just stick my hand into the sock drawer and pull out two and they would always match as a like oh. to eliminate decision making and also save time in the morning. So that's like a more yeah. uh, almost stupid experiment. Uh, growing yeah. a beard was one. Quitting. I, I, I don't, I'm going to interrupt you right now yeah, because yeah. I, that is actually a really good idea. Like, for example, I started to use the same clothes, yeah. not the same the same shirt for example but the same clothes like i don't have to choose between colors you know to match mm -hmm. like i really good out that, that decision making process and i'm being i have been eating the same meal like literally when i say literally i'm not lying i'm telling you the truth the same meal for the last six months i will say ah and... that's so funny <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that because that's what was one of my first experiments that i posted as well like my back be breakfast i do the same breakfast every day every day i think it comes from uh, maybe steve jobs biography like a lot of this come from the reading i do like okay this is a good idea because i think steve jobs he had similar to you one outfit that he wore every day so that he didn't have to make small decisions uh, and that led to me doing the sock thing <laughs> Did, how many of those experiments you have never shared on on your social media uh quite a few i think because i did that before as well i'm i really like like stats and tracking stuff that i do and uh, that's something i've always done i think and that's very closely related to all these experiments and um, but i think i haven't posted about all of them actually and I have a few ongoing as well that I haven't been able to post yet. I've, I'm doing one now where I've actually trying to start a business or I've always wanted to start my own business and try that kind of entrepreneurial 
uh, lifestyle sort of, but I never come up with a good idea or a great idea. So I thought, what if I turn everything around and I get a business mentor first, then I have to come up with the business idea. So that was one experiment that I did now. I just got myself a mentor uh, for businesses and that spawned a lot of business ideas actually. So it's kind of working. Uh, what else am I doing right now? I'm off caffeine since I read the book, Why We Sleep. Uh, it's also more of a lifestyle optimization experiment. No way. I'm <laughs> literally right now drinking my fourth uh, cup of coffee. Of How today. do you feel? How do you feel? I uh, feel pretty good, man. Yeah, that's good. I always tend to overdo stuff. That's the same thing I did. Um, in Sweden, we have something called snus. It's like it's tobacco that you put under your lip. And I've been on that uh, <laughs> for like 16 years or something. I've been, it's like smoking, basically, without the smoke. Uh, oh. And the thing is, I tend to overdo stuff. So what I did was I took so much snooze during the day that I really got a headache at the end of the day. And same with coffee. Uh, after I quit nicotine, I drank more coffee. So I drank so many cups of coffee that I got a headache. So I tend to overdo all these vices for some reason. Yeah. And that's why I need to get them out of my well, life because I can't handle it. Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely a good experiment to try and test it out. I mean, if it's beneficial for your health, man, go, go ahead. Uh, I, I have mean, nothing against coffee. It's just... Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. I, I also don't want to be like... When I quit stuff, I won't be like totally binary, like it's all or nothing. Uh, yeah. I mean, I drink coffee in social situation. I used to want to um, be dependent on it. That's what I think. Like the, it's the, the yeah. part that I I try to get out of my life. I kind of cycle coffee. Some days I mm -hmm. I just don't drink coffee at all. Maybe two, three days, and then I got back to coffee. Well, it's great that you can do that. I can. I'm. I'm all or nothing when it comes to that stuff. Okay. Well, well, definitely, it's, it's an experiment after all. Mm -hmm. And I quit smoking like two hundred days ago. Ah, I think. congratulations! Yeah, and and drinking almost the same amount of time, maybe a bit more than two hundred, maybe a year. Yeah, right now. Yeah, man. Wow. But I used to smoke because I was super anxious. Mm. I, I I approached this, it was an experiment, obviously, but uh, I'm going to call it experiment. Uh, I approached it from the inside and the outside. First, I stopped to, to buy cigarettes, which is obvious is the first thing that you get to do. Mm -hmm. And the second one, I started to work more into my, my journaling, my mindfulness to, to see, okay, what's triggering my behavior? Okay, something is happening inside. Ah. And it, and it works, man. It works. Man, yeah, how, yeah. Do you decide, how do you decide what's going to be your next experiments? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I get ideas usually from books. That's mostly it. And other people that I follow online that I find ins inspiring, I think. Um, but usually it's ideas that I take from my reading, like my main takeaways. So if I read a book about uh habits then maybe i take one of the ideas there like a main concept and turn that into an experiment but I, usually when i find something that i'm really excited about i want to try it out uh, i read the uh, mahatma gandhi's uh, autobiography a while back and then i got the idea of trying to do fasting because that's not not something we do in my culture at all we we eat all the time right so it's also something I wanted to, because there's, there's a lot of cultures where you do fasting for religious reasons, for yeah. other people do it for like fitness reasons, losing weight and all that. And that's one of those things you can read, really, but you have to experience it yourself to get the real knowledge about it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. I, I also started fasting two Mondays ago. Uh, hey. Like intermittent fasting. Yeah, I used to do the sixteen eight yeah, fasting. Yeah, yeah. 
And on the first Monday, uh, means two weeks ago, I fasted for 23 hours. And the second Monday, I fasted for 20, 21 hours. So I'm looking forward for this next Monday, man. <laughs> so every Monday is uh, fast day. Um, yeah, basically, I no. will say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will see in the patterns. I was thinking about having one day a month that I don't eat for. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to combine though this practice that I believe. Um, I'm trying to combine this idea of fasting from Buddhism and mm -hmm. this uh, practicing poverty from Stoicism. So that mm -hmm. day I do allow myself to eat something but it's pretty, pretty humble, my meal, I will say, like oatmeal, just oatmeal, blank oatmeal with just hot water or, or something like that, right? I don't, I, I don't just use my last hour window to just fill my gut. I just go like, okay, okay, I'm going to be grateful. I fasted for, I don't know, 23 hours. Okay, I'm going to eat a small portion of oatmeal. So it's like, I try to combine those two practices. One, I like, like that, this. I like that. This stems from the Stoic idea of, uh, what is it called? Voluntary deprivation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to uh, deprive yourselves of some uh, comforts just to be able to appreciate them more later on. Uh, what are the books that have inspired some of your experiments? Now that you're talking about this voluntary deprivation, I'm pretty sure that you posted... Um, I can't remember the name. A guide to good life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. So people listening can go and check them out. So, what are the books? Other books uh, have inspired some of your experiments. Yeah, uh, that is that is a big one actually. A guide to the good life by what is called Irvine something, because that's inspired my stoic experiments of what we talked about the voluntary discomfort. Uh, mm -hmm. Trying to sleep without a pillow uh, for a while and sleep on the floor for a week. My wife thought I was uh, crazy, probably, <laughs> and I didn't drink for a day. And all of those were quite interesting water? experience. You, you mean you didn't drink water for the whole day? Yes. Wow. Yeah, wow. It's, uh, I, I, I thought it wouldn't work. Like that, and that's also a little bit of a, the main point with the experiments. Yeah, you have this preconceived notion of how it's going to be. Like, what happens if I don't drink on a day? And then I, yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't super hard either. It's like, and that's kind of the benefit of doing experience it yourself. Like, you learn something about yourself while doing it because you go through the experience. Yeah, I think that we, we should all challenge our our yeah. beliefs man at least once before dying man but i guess you had the same experience when you tried fasting like you had um version vision in your head of how it's going to be and it wasn't it was similar to that but not quite that no absolutely yeah, yeah you're right yeah. man you know what should be your next experiment man you should try and put out i don't know six five episodes of a podcast man uh that would be fun I've thought about it. People have uh, come up with that idea as well. I just trying to be, wow. I mean, having two kids right now, I, I'm being conservative with what I take on right now. But yeah, maybe next year. <laughs> yeah, why not? I would love to help, man. You yeah, yeah. I will totally down to help you. Um, by the way, people can find a few highlights from your rejection experiment on your Instagram page. Uh, yes, dude, yeah. a whole month looking for rejection. Oh yeah, that was a that was a fun one. That was part of. I have this book club that I'm running. Uh, with, <laughs> well, it's actually not a book club because the, the main focus is on implementing ideas from books. So we have a book. Um, in this case, with the re reaction therapy experiment, it was a book called Rejection Proof by a guy called Jia Jiang. And he, in this book, he talks about an experiment that he did called 100 Days of Rejection. And that's basically what the book is about. It goes through why he started this uh, challenge, because he 
maybe wasn't very confident and he was really uh, adverse to getting rejected and he also made some mistakes thanks to being rejected and he was trying to com combat that situation so in the book club what we did was every week we set out a few challenges for ourselves that we were going to going to implement uh, during the week and then we reported back to the group the book club is uh, we're just in a whatsapp group it's a chat program where we communicate by voice and text messages and videos so it's quite asynchronous but it's it's really fun so <laughs> uh but and this time this just turned out to be really funny because people started to share videos where they did all this they were asking for crazy stuff basically this was this was in the middle of the corona or we're in the middle of corona crisis now but this was in the first weeks of the corona so it was kind of hard to go up to people because I mean, most people were in lockdown so we did a lot of things online yeah. uh one uh, girl that was in the book club i know she used uh mcdonald's drive throughs uh to get rejected so she went out went with a car every day to mcdonald's and asked with her order to get a free big mac <laughs> every day and i those videos are so funny i <laughs> i still laugh when i think about them um I was in Sweden and we didn't have as serious of a lock lockdown as many other countries, but it, it was interesting. I can tell you a few examples of the asks that I did if you want to. Oh, please. Yeah. I would love to. Uh, it might sound like this is nothing, but I, I guess I'm more afraid of rejections than I thought uh, when I started to do this. Because uh, I noticed myself more practicing asking rather than practicing being rejected. Uh, like it was really hard and so I, we ordered I ordered a square I tried to order square pizza from the pizza restaurant uh, that was not very hard but they actually said yes so I wasn't rejected <laughs> which was kind of funny so uh, because like when I called they were like uh, okay um, they, they were very suspicious of my order because I made sure that it was very important that the pizza should be square shaped and they was like okay uh uh, we'll see what we can do. And then when I got there, I was met with a, a, a pizza pizza guy with a big smile on his face. And he said, like, ah, this was, really, this was really a funny challenge. I did my best here. Here, look at it. And I could see his uh, square pizza that he did. Uh, it was fun because it looked like it, my stupid ask uplifted his day somewhat. Uh, another thing that I did that I really thought I would be rejected from was that I... I have a, this company that makes some really cool t-shirts and I recorded a video pitching myself to them and said that they should sponsor me with free t-shirts. I expected it to be rejected there, but uh, like a few weeks later, I got like $300 worth of merchandise <laughs> delivered to my, my door. So it, it actually turned out to become a real sponsorship. Awesome. Uh, and I think that's the main lesson from all of these rejections as well. Like, how many, like, I, like things happen when you ask for it. And I feel like, what if I had asked for more stuff before I did all this? Like, if I knew about this five, ten years ago, how many opportunities have I missed? Uh, so it's kind of eye opening. I also got. Uh, I tried to, I reached out to this guy, Daniel Priestley. It's like a millionaire entrepreneur author and asked him to uh, do a plug for my book club as well. And just like an hour afterwards, I got this video with him pitching my book club. Uh, we were going to read his book, of course, but I didn't expect that. And I wouldn't have asked if I didn't do these challenges. So it's it's really interesting. You say that you didn't ask weird questions. What will have been a weird question? Uh, one I wanted to do was uh, I wanted to go and talk to someone in a Tesla and ask if I could sit in his car. <laughs> uh, because I never sit, uh, sat in a Tesla and I would like to try that. <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't the Corona times isn't the best for those kind of asks. No. I did one yeah. that I thought was really, really hard, and I didn't 
expect it to be hard. Like when I thought about it in my head, it felt like, okay, this is nothing. But then like the seconds before the ask, I really almost felt sick for, in a way. And it's a quite kind of a small one. It was also a McDonald's thing. I, I, my business mentor asked me, he challenged me to ask for a complimentary thing at McDonald's. So I went to McDonald's, ordered my burger and asked they, after I paid and they delivered the order, I used to ask for a free dip sauce. And I, I felt really terrible <laughs> for some reason. So, I mean, when you do this stuff, you get to learn something about yourself because I, I really thought that wouldn't be hard, but I felt really shameful afterwards for mm. asking for it. Maybe it was because the, like the store clerk, she was kind of a, gave me like a, a certain look when I asked for it. I don't know what it was, but it, it didn't feel good. So <laughs> I, also, I also actually got to help out in the store uh, refilling oranges. So that was another thing that I did is to ask if I could work a little bit in the store, filling up the fruit session. And they said yes. <laughs> so... But it's fun. Like uh, it's very memorable. I mean, these are these are small things, and that's what I, I want to do later on. I want to redo this experiment when things in the world get a little bit better, so you can actually approach people without without being feeling weird about that with the corona and everything. Uh, you then really go do a hardcore version of reaction therapy because I, I mean, there's a lot of growth in there, and man, like like every time you do it, you have you get a good memory, like. Some of my best memories from this year is from doing all these challenges because, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and definitely. Man, I have a lot to ways to go. Yeah. I mean, none of these are spectacular in any way, but for me, it was really hard. Yeah, man, you <laughs> you end up with feeling of self realization. As certain will certain Kierkegaard will say, no, that the anxiety is the path of self realization. There's some, there is something in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Did I read that one of the best investments and decisions you have ever made was joining Toastmasters? And I'll leave to you to explain what Toastmasters is, but could you speak to that experience and how Warren Buffett influenced partially your decision? Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, Toastmasters, it's... Um... It's a public speaking club. It's international. It's worldwide. You can find it in most uh, major cities. It's been around for hundreds of years, I think. And it's a place for people who want to become better at public speaking or maybe you have a fear of public speaking. You can go to the meeting and present speeches and you get feedback from the rest of the... It's a club environment, so all the members give you feedback. It's super structured. It's it's really cool, actually. Um and yeah, uh, I read, uh, going back to Warren Buffett, I read his biography by Alice Schroeder, I think the author name is. And in that book, it's like 700 pages or something. He gives one advice because he is asked, uh, what was his best investment, I think? And he answers, oh, it was to take Dale Carnegie's uh, public speaking course. So I thought to myself, mm -hmm. okay. This man is quite successful. I read about his life in this biography now, and yeah, he's, he's a person that I would like to be influenced by. And if that if a person like that says that his best investment is learning public speaking, then probably I should try it out. So that's how I got into public speaking. Of course, there is some other drive behind it. I mean, I've been really, I'm not, I don't have straight st stage fright, but I, I'm adverse to like speaking in front of a, crowd it's not my it's not within my comfort zone so to speak so i it was also something that i wanted to improve on myself uh, so that's how i started there and it was and he, he was right actually i think it was my best <laughs> investment ever it's hard work i did 10 speeches and like the first one i i, I don't i was so nervous i remember nothing from performing the speech I couldn't do any work uh, like that whole day leading up to the speech, but afterwards, like man, it's it was quite cool to go through that and doing that over and over again, you become more confident. And 
suddenly you, you can do it without, of course, you, we always get nervous. We don't get rid of all the nervousness, but we get rid of like the bad <laughs> nervousness somehow by just exposing ourselves to it over and over again. And you also get good by getting feedback from other people and peers and people sharing you on in an environment like that. So it's really, it was a really cool experience. I recommend it to anyone. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I'll definitely try try it out. Those masters, I was checking that page out, and uh, I think that there is one on hidden Chile. So maybe when we back, we go back to normal. I'm gonna try it out, man. Dude, when you were nervous before those uh, speeches that you were, what was one? Do you have any tool to share that you use? Maybe was a an inner dialogue or a mindful practice that you that you focused on before getting in front of the other people in that that class if we could call it that like mm -hmm. a class uh, let's see with me if i have any like mindset or something i say to myself before i go in front of a crowd uh, not not really actually but by doing it over and over again i've and i also messed up i messed up badly i lost like my total train of thought in the middle of a speech and stand been standing silent for one minute just trying to get back to what I'm going to say and that experience alone has been one of the best lessons like you don't die <laughs> you feel like you're going to die but like it's okay uh, and it was really a powerful experience uh, because I got the feedback later on and people said oh you handled that really good when you Uh, lost the thread there um, but when it comes to going up on stage and what do I say to myself but one thing that I do is when I stand come up and stand in front of the audience I take a deep breath look at people in the eye just give give, give some space before I start Uh, I think that's really good. I don't know if it helps with nervousness, but it just calms things down. It's so easy to just go full throttle right away. So it's good to just go up there and stand there, look out in silence, in calm before you start. Yeah, that's an awesome idea, man. Let's let's talk about your reading process. But before we get into that, I would like to know what has to have a book to catch your attention. I mean. What's your book selection criteria? Uh, I don't have a structured like, selection criteria. I, but I also have no, no, I have so many books to read. My to read list is super long. Uh, I'm very spontaneous in how I pick my books, but usually I rely a lot on people recommending me books. It's either from the book community, like I'm very active in Instagram community where we first connected, And then books themselves uh, can give you great tips for books because they usually have either the reference uh, books inside or you have the appendix or like the in towards the end, there's all the books or further reading section. That's a great sources for finding more really good books. And I also try to study reading lists from uh, prominent people like Bill Gates, what is he reading? Uh, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger is one of my favorite persons to look into his reading list. Actually, uh, are you familiar with uh, Real Social Dynamics? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. They yeah. are the, the first people that I heard and, and I look up to back then on 2017 when I started this, this world of self-improvement, man. Yeah, well, that's cool. That's cool because... Uh, I have gotten a lot of uh, book recommendations from Owen on Real Social Dynamics. As yeah, you can... really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, oh, I don't remember any specific ones, but I, uh, I picked a lot of books from his recommendation because uh, most of them, uh, them I just loved because it's a lot of psychology, a lot of human nature type books, uh, communication skills. Like there's, uh, it's, he has a lot of good recommendations. So prominent people from from books and from the book community and people I trust there. Uh, that's where I get my books well, from. I gotta, now that you mention it, I got to recognize that 
because of Julian Blanc, that is also part of uh, RSD, I I read uh, The Power of Now from Eckhart Tolle huh? and the slide from Jeff Olson. And I think that, well, the power, of, the power of Now, I already told you, and we talked about this when we... Because we actually, for the people listening, kind of, I react to a lot of your, your posts, and I told you that The Power of Now was the book that pretty much changed my whole paradigm mm. about about myself. And The Slight Edge is a book uh, that I finished in three, four days, maybe. But if there is something that I learned from that book, is that there is no no secret, so to say, to success. It's just uh, compound interest, so to say. It's like show up every single day, be consistent, hard work, and, and there you go. Like If you put yourself on the path of success, that is being consistent and showing up every single day, is something that is going to happen. It's inevitable. You're going to be and end up being successful. Yeah. Mm. I I know you have a book club. Well, you, you, you already mentioned it. Paul Beyond's book club. So if you want to promote it, this is the the perfect moment, my man. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a book club with a focus on implementation. Um, I mean, there's a lot of book clubs out there, but what we try to do is uh, it's like 25% reading the book. Of course, we discussed the book, but it's 75% uh, accountability group and just focusing on implementing what we've done. We have done several books, like we did uh, Rejection Proof, which was the, one of the most fun ones where we got uh, rejected. Uh, right now, we're doing Atomic Habits right now, building some good habits. Ooh, ooh. Starting some clear, right? uh, one more time. James Clear? James Clear, yes. Uh, it's a great oh, book. Awesome. Uh, so we're just starting that one. So I'm in the starting phases trying to figure out what kind of habits I need to build. We've also done business books. We did Oversubscribed by Daniel Priestley uh, with a bunch of people just starting up their services. So it's just good to get together like line, like-minded people from all around the world reading the same book and taking those strategies, going out in real life, applying them and then reporting back to group. So it's both fun and serious. Um, I, it's been going now since I think I started in November or something. So I think it's, this is sixth edition or so. So I'm always trying to improve the format. We have some live calls. We have the WhatsApp group where we, as I said, we talk to video, text messages and voice. But mm -hmm. it's, it's really fun. It's a great way to learn. I mean, your retention really skyrockets when you get into <laughs> an environment like that where you have to share your takeaways where you have to implement it right away. It's quite different from sitting by yourself and reading a book. Dude, I still think that it's unbelievable that you read 80 books in a year. And yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that was that year. I, I actually, by purpose, reduced my reading because, I mean, you can read, if you read 80 books, how much action can you actually take? How much can you implement? Like, so I, mm. I try to balance that in a way because there's so many ideas in each book. And if you just... Yeah, yeah. I want to go back to that, this idea uh, because I barely read one book every two months, if that. And mm. it's not that I don't like reading. It's just that I spend a lot of time taking notes. So I mm. think I could read one book a month if I didn't take note. But then I will feel that I will be leaving a lot of insights on the table. Mm. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it makes total sense. Uh, it's a I dilemma. Can't... I mean, if you want to study a book, it's, it's like there's a difference between studying a book and reading a book. I feel. I think oh. like what both you, you and I try to do is study a book. We take notes. Yeah. We look at those notes. Maybe after a certain time, after three months, we review the notes. We write summaries. Maybe and that's more. It takes a lot longer than just going through cr a crime novel after crime novel. I think that's going to be a good introduction for this next question. Could you share some tips on how people can make the most out of the time they spend reading? Or perhaps you could share what does your reading process look like? I am pretty sure this is going to be super helpful, not just for me, but also for the people listening. Um, yes, absolutely. I have a few things that I do to 
mostly focused on improving my retention, uh, but also how to get more reading done as well. Uh, so my life situation is quite chaotic right now. I have small children. I'm on parent leave uh, again. It's just crazy, but I try to do my best. But uh, some, the first one we have already talked about is take notes. Uh, I do notes on my phone right now. I did handwritten notes before. Uh, I think handwritten is better. For, I just feel like Ooh. it sticks more. Like there's some kind of communication between the brain and the hand and the paper that's happening. That's uh, much more. Uh, it gives. It, it gives. Uh, I think it signals to the brain. This is absolutely pseudoscience. Su su pseudoscience. So don't quote me on this. But it's just like the hand signals to the brain. No, this no, but make sense. this is important, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. When I write it down, and I, I don't feel like I get that with the phone. But the reason I choose the phone right now is because I always bring it with me. I can't. I don't lose it. I save all my notes in the clouds. It's searchable. So I think the phone wins. Anyway, because with the search function, it's just unbeatable, especially when you have tons of notes. So taking notes, and if you take notes, you need to review the notes. Um, I struggle with this sometimes, but I try to go back and read the notes again. Maybe after six months, I go back and read notes from the last six or seven books that I've uh, read. This really helps just to get the information stuck in memory. And a big one is also to write summaries. And that's the reason why I started my Instagram account initially, because I had a, written all these summaries with my own words. Because there's some power in that, taking a book that is written by someone else, but then you want to turn it into, then you write a summary of that in your own words. And then you have to really define the ideas in your head and structure things in your head in a way that make you retain the information much much better. If you can do, this is number four, right? Write summaries, yes. And teach others is a good, good idea. Um, I do this through stories sometimes. So maybe it's also for other people, of course, people find value in it, but it's also for me, because if I record a video of me teaching someone what I learned from a book, I would remember that information much better. And also discuss with peers or with friends or on Instagram or forums. Uh, yeah. There are some tips for just for retention. But when it comes to reading more, uh, getting more reading done, because that's something I know people struggle with because people reach out sometimes and say, what, how can you read so many books? Uh, I try to read one book, but I can't. And it all comes down to consistency right you want to read every day you don't have to read a lot you don't have to sit down for hours it's just the consistency of reading every day uh it just adds up even if you read 15 minutes 30 minutes that's that's a lot of books in a year but yeah. very little time each day and one thing that really really helps me is audiobooks audiobooks i know it's not my preferred format but I take what I get right now, and I mean that really helps you get through your reading list because you can do it uh, in situations where you couldn't pull up a book when you're driving a car, when you're doing chores, when you yeah, any and you bring and you also have it in your phone, right? Yeah, reading multiple multiple books at a time, and why is this right? Well, because during the day you have you are in different moods, right? You are in a different mood in the evening than you are in the morning, and from day to day your mood change. So you want to have books that um, support those moods. So I, I usually have a biography. I have a, maybe some how-to book, like like the habit building book we were talking about, the med, uh, Atomic Habits. Uh, I maybe have like a fictional classic book and something else like a philosophy book that that way yeah. i can always yeah sure yeah because i can relate to that idea I, I thought i was the only one and i also thought that i was doing it wrong because when i was reading reading the 48 laws of power from robert mm -hmm. green i wasn't in a good place mentally mm -hmm. so i was also consuming this information that is super uh 
Machiavellic, so to say, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and also Robert said oh. that when he wrote the Forty Years Laws of Power, he was actually mad. So <laughs> he was supercharged with some sort of negative energy. And mm -hmm. I felt during that time that I that I needed to take some breaks and read some Stoicism, some Seneca uh -huh. or Marcus Aurelius. But I that but I felt guilty. I was like, shit, I should be finishing one book at a time. Mm -hmm. But no, now that you mention it. You also follow this idea. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Because, I mean, that's, that's also a way that it ties back to consistency. Uh, you want to uh, remove all the obstacles and all the reasons for procrastination, right? So if you have multiple books and you don't feel like reading uh, The 48 Laws of Power, because, yeah, I, I know people struggle with that book because it can feel very, very Machiavellian and kind of, it's a, it's a downer, basically. Then if you have other things, then there's that's um, there's something else you can read. Then you might not procrastinate on reading that day. So it's just helping us with that. And that I brings see. me to my last tip, which is always bring a book wherever you go. Yeah. Because you never mm -hmm. know uh, when an opportunity arises when you can read. Um, yeah. You're waiting for a friend. He's late. You get 10 minutes. You're missing the bus. You get... Then another 10 minutes, you stand in the queue, in the line somewhere to a concert. You get 30 minutes. I mean, it adds up. It all adds up. Awesome. When, when it comes to taking notes, do you try to go as accurate as possible? Do you try to quote uh, kind of transcript what you're reading? How is your, your process? Uh, it's good. It's not... It's hard to answer because I don't know myself. I don't have a structure really. I just do it. Uh, the, <laughs> what I what I try to do is I'm sorry. Maybe I want to 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 reframe that case the, the question. Maybe it was it wasn't absolutely well formulated. Okay. I mean, I know that it depends and it changes. But for example, something that I also feel guilty while reading is that sometimes. A whole page, I feel there is so much information uh -huh. that I would love to know and to share and to and to retain, so to say. So I kind of almost transcript the whole page. Uh, Do you okay. feel guilty of this sin, so, mm. so to speak? Uh, it's like you're standing beneath a waterfall and trying to catch all the water. Yeah, kind of, kind of. It's kind of stressful. Uh, I don't have that. I, it's a little bit like... You have to let go somehow. Like I, I had, this, I have the same urge. Like I, I read this book called *The Denial of Death*. It's a super dense book, psychology book. Like it's like every page is like just big ideas, mind blowing stuff everywhere. And it's, it's, you have to. I try to frame it like, okay, I'm gonna read this book several times, and I just take the, the thing that is stands out absolutely the most to me. So I take a a sentence mm -hmm. here, write that down. Or I also write, I don't only quote the book, I also write down my own thoughts that are triggered by what I'm reading. So it's a mix between like underlining or um, quoting the book and my own thoughts. Uh, I write down book recommendations that I find from the book. Uh, I argue with the author uh, on the pages sometimes. What's the third best book you can think of right now the third best book yeah. right now um, a really good book i mean there's so many i just take something uh, i like influence by robert cialdini it's a quite accessible book have you read it i think that i read the psychology of persuasion that's robert. one yeah that's one uh, I read it very early in my reading career, and it really blew my mind. Like it's very easy, easy to take on, but it exposed me for the first time to all these cognitive biases that we have, the shortcut that we, the brain takes for uh, making our days <laughs> livable. Basically, we need to take shortcuts in our reasoning; otherwise, every challenge would be like insurmount an insurmountable problem. And the thing is, people try to use those shortcuts to their advantage to either sell us something or we can use them to influence other people and i just think that's that's one of those books that 
uh, I thought to myself after reading this, like, wow, why don't we learn this in school? Why do we read all these other books but we don't learn stuff like this? Like, uh, it was really mind blowing to me. I felt like it was, this is something that should be mandatory reading for <laughs> everyone. It should be, man. In the book. Um, yeah, the, I think that the educational system, I'm not going to start to to criticize the educational system right now, but I believe that yeah. it should mainly focus. If there is some sort of revolution or reform, it should focus on uh, social skills, definitely, on emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. definitely, and teaching the kids how finances works. Like, yeah, math is important, but then teaching how to pay taxes, how to avoid taxes <laughs> in, some, in some cases. Yeah. Um, how to you know how to ask good questions, man? That's super important. I can't remember who said this, but someone said that uh, your quality of life is defined. The quality of the questions of a man mm -hmm. define his quality of life. Yeah, I, I uh, may be surprised this. I can't remember who actually said that that quote. Um. Anyways, I want you to think of a passage from your life where you were immersed. On a huge amount of self-doubt. Um, what would you tell to your younger self that he doesn't know, but that you currently know, and that it's going to save him weeks or months or years of unnecessary suffering or fear of or self-confidence mm -hmm. issues? What would you tell your younger self? Ah, shit. Well, if if they can do it, you can do it. Look at all, uh, I heard something about, yeah, I mean, look at all those things around me and how right in front of me now we have this computer, like people have made this thing, people like you, look at that, like 8-bit Nintendo or, or what was it back then, it was the PlayStation, I think, PlayStation, PlayStation 2, right, that's, that's people that make those things, those games, that's regular people, it's not gods, it's, and if they can do it, you can do it. Tack Björn, tack för att du var på huvuden. Ja, ah, men tack ska du ha. Det är perfekt. Awesome, man. Awesome. Yeah. All the sweet things be mind blown by that. <laughs> man, thank you, Björn. Have a good night. No, thank you.